Every religion has its beginnings, and today on Wednesdays with Willa, we'll be talking about the birth of modern spiritualism. I am Willa White, your host of Wednesdays with Willa. This is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. This is my opportunity to have a special guest on the show, and we usually talk about a spiritual topic relating to spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, and more. And it's always a delight to welcome different guests on the show. Today, I have Tracy Murphy. Thanks for being on the sh show today, Tracy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yes, yeah, it's so great. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Fox Sisters and modern spiritualism. That's our topic today. And Tracy is well-versed in this particular topic because she is the caretaker and historian of the Fox property, also known as the Hydesville Memorial Park. We're going to tell you a bit more about that as we go on in the show, but I just want to make sure you know that you can tune in to Wednesdays with Willa on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium, and also this will be posted later onto my YouTube channel, Willa White. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into the topic of the Fox Sisters and modern spiritualism. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite topic. <laughs> So usually I like to start at the beginning, um, but I have found that the more that I do this, um, the more I have to kind of condense it because there is a lot of information. And because I've been um, doing this for so long, um, I, I feel like I'm always finding new information uh, to the point where I sometimes I feel like a Fox family member. There's got to be a connection somewhere in my life. There has to be. <laughs> well, you are um, in their house right now. So you I am. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in, I'm in the parlor. <laughs> yes. So that's a picture of their, of their cottage and yes. uh, their fireplaces right behind you. Mm. So yes, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty neat. Um, so a lot of people, you know, when I ask them, oh, do you know the story of the Fox sisters? Um, they usually say a few things. Oh, yeah, we heard about those two girls that talked to a spirit. Oh, yeah, we heard they faked the whole thing. And, you know, and then that's pretty much all they know. Um, and sadly, sometimes it is people who are spiritualists that say this. And I always think, my goodness, what are they teaching you? Because, you know, spiritualism 101 should begin with Hydesville and the Fox sisters, in my opinion. Um, in our little Hydesville, uh, it was a hamlet. It was established back in 1814 by a gentleman uh, by the name of Henry Hyde. And he was a doctor who came here to our area. And he was going to practice medicine. When he got here, he realized how rural the area was. So he had to go with plan B and plan B was to build a tavern. And with the tavern, he was able to make a lot of money and he started buying up the land in his area. When he did that, he started building these little homes. And so people could come and rent these homes and they could also farm the land so it was a win-win situation for everyone um, he was a, a very smart man and he was able to practice medicine after a while so he was a dr hyde instead of a was, dr jekyll <laughs> dr hyde yes oh my goodness i'm sorry i couldn't read this oh no no we didn't we didn't have any Jekylls, but we were Good. close. We Good. were close. Yes, we had jewels. Jewels. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> so uh, by the time the Fox family came to Hydesville, um, there had already been a few people that were living in the Hyde's cottage, as it was known. And actually, uh, Dr. Hyde was gone. His son had taken over his estates. And uh, he was in charge of this property. Now, when the, the uh, property was rented out, one of the first families that rented the property was the Bell family. And the Bell family consisted of a husband and wife. And they had a young girl by the name of Lucretia Pulver. And she was their boarder. Um, when these 
people lived so far away from a school, it was hard for these young kids to get a good education. And so Lucretia, um, in exchange for room and board, would do chores. And while she was in their home, she would do these chores for the family. But then during the week, she was allowed to go to school. She would generally go home on the weekends. Um, one day, they were home. And a peddler showed up at the house and he was welcomed as if he were an old friend by Mrs. Bell. Um, Mr. Bell did not seem too pleased about this. And uh, the peddler came in and showed the ladies what he had. Um, unfortunately, Lucretia didn't have any money. And so she asked him, you know, she said, I'm going to be going home in a few days. Would it be possible for you to stop at my father's house? and he will pay you um, for these goods. And the peddler agreed. Um, sometime in the course of the afternoon, for whatever reason, Mrs. Bell decided that uh, Lucretia was gonna go home early. And so they hitched the horse and wagon and Mrs. Bell personally took her home, leaving Mr. Bell and the peddler at the cottage. Now, back then, uh, if it was dark, it was customary for your person to have these people spend the night uh, because you certainly didn't want to send somebody out into the dark. I don't know. You and know can it. we give them a little bit of a uh, time frame of when this was? So this would have been probably about 1836. So around 1836, and this is predating the Fox sisters. It's just yes. giving people a little bit of a layer of background. Yes. What was going on. So yes. stay tuned, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big story. Um, so when Mrs. Bell returned home, um, they went to bed. Uh, the next day, she went back to Lucretia's house and pretty much begged her to come back. She had made a mistake. She wanted Lucretia to come back with her. And Lucretia was okay with that. So they were coming back home and Mrs. Bell was very chatty and talking about all the wonderful things that she had purchased from the peddler. And Lucretia was kind of upset because the peddler never showed up, never came to her dad's, never brought the goods that he had promised. And she was pretty upset about that. And uh, Mrs. Bell didn't seem to really care about it. Uh, once they were back at the cottage, uh, Lucretia went about fixing the evening meal. She went into the cellar and, and she fell into a large hole. Uh, when she screamed out, Mrs. Bell just kind of, you know, chastised her and said, stop your screaming. And, you know, it's probably rats digging these holes in oh, the basement. Gosh. Right? Yeah. Large enough for a, a body. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I should give the people a spoiler alert that if you have your children watching, you may want to watch this another time. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so here's poor Lucretia uh, falling in the basement. Um, when she came up, Mrs. Bell directed Mr. Bell to go out and get some field stones and some dirt and fill in the hole. And uh, apparently he did. Um, it was a few days later that they started experiencing um, some strange phenomena. They were hearing uh, rapping noises. It, it sounded like someone was um, knocking on the door. And so- I'll do it right now for you. Exactly. And Mr. Bell would go and look and see if anybody was out there. And of course, no one was there. Um, sometimes it sounded like someone was knocking on the windows. Um, chairs would move. It sounded to Lucretia like, you know, there was a body being drugged down the stairs into the cellar. And she would complain about these things uh, to the Bells. And they just kind of brushed it off like she was, you know, just being silly. Um, it got to the point where Lucretia begged her family to keep her home. She did not want to go back to the Bells. And around this time, uh, Mrs. Bell's health started to decline and Mr. Bell's health started to decline. And so 
for whatever reason, um, they moved and uh, the house was empty. Um, so before you go on, um, where would this information be? Was it in a journal or how did they get this information from uh, this viewpoint of Lucretia, basically, that you're sharing? So a lot of the information that I have, a lot of the history comes from sworn affidavits from the family, the Fox family, from Lucretia Pulver, uh, okay. from pretty much everyone except for the Bells. Because by that time, by 1848, um, they were gone. Um, they, they just weren't, they weren't able to be found, but this all comes from different neighbors. Um, okay. so that's where that information comes from. Beautiful. Thing. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> In, uh, 1840, I think it was like 1845, 1846, there was a family by the name of Weekmans, and they moved into the cottage. Uh, that family consisted of a husband and wife and two young children. And uh, they started hearing the noises almost immediately. Um, they were terrified. They didn't understand it. Um, the children would wake up in the middle of the night screaming because something cold had touched their face. And this is why uh, I told you to not have children in the room. If you don't, if you haven't removed them yet, then do so. Yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, yes, because it's, it's not something you want to hear at night. Your no. children don't want to hear this at night. Yeah, um, yeah because <laughs> it, it would get to the point where their beds would shake at night. And, you know, it was quite terrifying for them. Um, so there's this and, pattern of, of uh, physical phenomenon that's happening in the home yes absolutely um you know and I think about like when someone knocks on your door the first thing you think of is oh gosh who's here um you know and and this poor spirit that's rapping and knocking is probably thinking like why aren't they answering me <laughs> and uh well we know in 1847 um the Fox family moved in and uh, at that time, the Fox family consisted of John and Margaret, which were the parents, and Kate and Maggie Fox. And there's a lot of different uh, ages for the girls around this time. Yeah, I noticed um, in the books I read, too, that some people would say this is their age and some people would say that it was. Yes. So there seems to be a debate. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I I like to think that they were about nine and eleven when they were there. Um, from a lot of the research that I've done and time frames, it, it looks like they were um, fairly young. Um, Maggie would have been the only one going to school um, at that time, getting her education. Um, but they moved in. It was the winter time. And it was just the four of them. Now, one of the reasons they moved to Hydesville is because their only son, David Fox, lived in Hydesville. And he lived on Parker Road. He lived two and a half miles away from the cottage. Uh, his house is actually still there today. Um, and I've been in there, so I've been very lucky. I'm friends with the owners and... Um, you know, small town, it, it works out really and, well. And you can see just, in, and you describing about the, the backstory leading up that you really immersed yourself in this world. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like you're taking us on a little hustle step back into history. Yeah. And yep. take you into these people's lives and what was going on. It, it's very amazing the things that I have learned, not just about Kate and Maggie, um, but about their sisters and not just Lee. Yeah. This, you know, I, I learned all about um, Elizabeth and, okay. um, and Maria and David, you know, every single one because of them. They, they don't really get airtime because they're not really oh. part of the magic that, that uh, Tracy is just about to tell you about. I shouldn't yes. say magic, but in this, in right, this, yes. this story. Yes. Yeah. Right. So when the Fox family moved here, um, Mr. Fox's intention was to rent the cottage. Um, he was a blacksmith by trade. 
And right at the end of the property was where the blacksmith station was. And so he was working there and he was building a home that was on a corner lot of David's property. And so um, they moved in with the intention of, you know, not staying very long, just him building this big family home next to their son um, because they, they were older. The girls were um, fairly young and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fox were worried that if something ever happened to them, you know, if they were living in, in Rochester or even in Canada, um, that, you know, if something happened to them, where were the girls going to go? And that's and, a good thing to, to mention to people to orient them because they may not mm -hmm. understand where Hydesville is. Hydesville is located. How many minutes would you say from Rochester is Hydesville? Oh, probably about 20, 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, you know, half, you know, in the middle of New York state in the kind of upper middle part of New York state. And that's where mm -hmm. this hotbed of activity was going on. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I always forget to mention that, um, you know, the canal, the Erie Canal is a big part of a lot of Wayne County, which is where Hydesville was located. Um, one of the things that I found out in my research was that the Erie Canal was actually supposed to run through Hydesville. And yeah, and so the uh, farmers and the citizens of Hydesville were not happy about this. And they thought, you know, a stagnant body of water is going to ruin our farming community. Mm -hmm. It's going to be detrimental for us. And right. so when the surveyors put down the stakes, these smart farmers went out and picked those stakes up and moved them south. <laughs> And they were just like, let's just move the survey line. Right. Let's oh, just move funny. the line. And so <laughs> they did. And it's noted in the archives in Albany. Um, there was really no reason given. They just kind of dug where the stakes were. Um, but for Hydesville, it was devastating because obviously Hydesville became a road. Um, and Newark was put on the map. Newark was the big canal town for them. So wow. it just goes to yeah. show the, the politics involved in some of this. So yeah. getting back to the to the Fox family, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I know it's, this is the exciting part and we still need to talk about some of the aftermath that comes with it. But um, given that those other families, you know, what, what Lucretia and, the, and um, then the, the, the family before the Fox family that were in there and had those experiences. Now we know the ages, we know we're uh, 1847 mm -hmm. in getting into 1848 and what happens? So the evening of uh, March 31st, 1848, um, Mrs. Fox has directed the children to go to bed early. Um, everybody is pretty much worn out because it has been constant rapping noises since they moved in. And it always seems to happen right as they're going to bed. And so that particular evening, she tells them, um, you know, we are going to bed. If you hear any noises, we don't want to hear about it. You are not to entertain these noises. You are to ignore them and go to bed. And so the girls are in bed. Mrs. Fox is getting ready for bed when the rapping noises start again. And it's Kate who finally just for whatever reason says, do as I do. And she claps her hands three times and to her astonishment, and I'm sure the rest of her family, she hears an immediate three raps. And Maggie, uh, not to be outdone by her little sister says, do as I do. And she claps her hands three times, but doesn't make a sound. To which they receive three very loud raps. And Maggie yells out to her mother and says, oh, look, mother, they can see as well as hear. And that started it right there. That I believe was the breakthrough that that spirit was looking for and now he had an attentive audience 
And so, um, you know, looking at the children, I think Mrs. Fox was a little scared, um, but she was a, a brave woman. And she started saying some things to this mysterious noise. And so she started asking questions. Um, she asked how many children she had. And the answer was seven raps. Um, if you did not know the family, you would say, well, they got it wrong. They only had six children, but she actually had had a child that died in infancy. And so that was correct. Uh, they started asking more questions um, and all the questions they asked were answered in the affirmative. And so that led her to ask the question, will you continue making these noises if we call in the neighbors? And she got a yes. And so she sent out her husband to go get the neighbors. And, and are uh, you, are you saying this is like the middle of the night at that point? Or? This is a middle, this is, you're probably looking at like middle of the night for them in 1848 was probably like nine o'clock at night. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's like nine o'clock at night, but the right. end of March uh, is typically still cold in yes, New York state. Very. Yes. Yep. So she said, go out in the snow and, and go get some yep. neighbors. <laughs> oh yeah okay. go get the and it's not like they lived right next door you know so he had to go make that trek to go get the neighbors and of course you want to get neighbors who are going to believe you they're you know <laughs> i don't know you don't want to just... want somebody who believes <laughs> no. poor mr fox you know oh he had gosh. quite quite the the issue with this whole thing i think yeah i don't um, think he was but, very happy about this whole thing no absolutely not um for a lot of reasons uh, um you know and and he's one of the characters that i think um you know a lot of people describe him in the beginning as um you know an alcoholic a lost soul and um you know uh, most people don't realize there's a 14 year difference between david and maggie because mrs fox was fed up with her husband and the way he was treating um, you know, her and the children, and she packed them up and moved back in with her parents in oh, 14 years. So domestic. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and, and back thing. then that, that was unheard of. You just didn't do that. You kind of, you know, wrote it out until the yeah, end. There was a but, that uh, preservation that kicked in. So she sent them for the neighbors. Now the neighbors have arrived and what happened? Yep. So the neighbors are there, the Redfields, the Dussels, and they are asking questions, um, you know, and they they're they're there because they think they're in for, you know, a, a good laugh. Um, and actually, you know, Kate does point out at some some point during the night that, hey, you know, tomorrow's April Fool's. Somebody's trying to to fool us. Yeah. Um, but the you know, the rapping was just so prominent and would get loud um, when it was trying to be more persistent. Um, but the neighbors asked questions and all their questions were answered correctly as well. Um, David eventually comes down, someone goes and gets David um, and his wife and they come down. His wife looks at May Maggie and Kate and just is mortified because they are terrified they are just like what have we done this is crazy now we've got neighbors in the house um and they've also noticed that whenever the girls are together and they're asking questions the noises are louder and um more severe um and so mrs fox makes the decision to send the girls to david's house and it is the adults that stay and start asking questions. And David and one of the neighbors comes up with the idea of yelling out numbers or letters of the alphabet and having the spirit rap for the, the correct letter. Um, eventually, they even go on to write down the letters of the alphabet on cards um, and start using cards, but that is how they determined, um, you know, Mrs. Fox asked is, you know, is this a living person that's making these noises? And there was silence. Um, is this, are you, you know, are you a spirit? And the answer was yes. And that's how they started to um, have the conversation of who are you? And of course the answer was, um, I'm a peddler, my name is Charles, and I'm a widowed father of five. 
um, I was murdered and taken into the basement and buried. Sad story. Sad yeah. story. So, Very. so now uh, things start to get really whipped up into a frenzy at this point because it's starting to spread like wildfire. Uh, how, how much time did it take before the newspapers got a hold of this? I would say only a few days. And then they go uh, home and then and then it was it started to kind of go around the world as it were. Oh my gosh, this is happening. People, yes. people love think about all the 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 channels that have haunted oh this and haunted that. And yeah. especially during this time, I, I do feel people had already started to sit for, for spirit communication before this. Yes. So I, I we do need to so preface too. that people had already started to do that and had those mm -hmm. kinds of unique spirit experiences. But what is the distinction for the Fox sisters and what many people term the birth of modern spiritualism mm -hmm. is because it went out and it had this kind of, the, you know, once the journalism got a hold of it and it started showing up in all the papers and everything, then uh, there was this uh, re renewed fervor, fervor interest in communicating mm -hmm. with spirits. Yes, they say, they say in um, some of the newspaper reports uh, locally that um, within a few days times, there, there was already uh, 500 people coming to visit, um, you know, which, amazes me because that is all basically word of mouth and newspapers. There's no telephone, there's no internet or anything like that. So, you know, it's your neighbors telling neighbors, telling neighbors, um, but they did have a lot of visitors. Um, and then a bunch of investigators started to really arrive. And mm -hmm. I believe uh, some people of, of uh, high repute, like Judge Edmonds and things like that, they, some of those mm -hmm. people started to investigate matters. Absolutely. They were trying to take it. Shall we take it seriously or not? It is the big right. question of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think also here in Wayne County, Wayne County is known as the burned over district. And some people have heard of it and some people haven't. Um, but it was basically because there were these revivals and this religion was popping up everywhere. Um, you know, and here in in Wayne County, they say we have the Shakers, the Quakers, and the Money Makers. And um, you know, in the in Palmyra, we had Mormons and you know the the friends of so and so. And um, so it really was, you know, I think a lot of the people were like, oh no, not again. What's going on? So they had to come and see it for themselves. Um, and then to, to hear that, oh, well, this spirit is saying that he's buried in the basement grab a shovel let's go um, <laughs> let's you know prove and, this or not for, yeah, right yeah. exactly and you know and they did they would go into the cellar they would start digging and next thing they knew um you know water was filling the basement so they had to stop um and then you know it it went on for a couple weeks until finally uh lee fox who was living in rochester um somebody stopped her on the sidewalk in the city and said, hey, aren't you, aren't your parents living in Hydesville and aren't you so-and-so? And she was just like, yeah, why, what's going on? And they're like, oh, well, don't you know what's going on at the old spook house in Hydesville? And so she jumped on the bar of uh, one of the packet boats and came down the canal and came into Hydesville. And uh, she didn't stop at the house at first. She went right to David's and was, she took one look at her mother and was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Um, and then she went down into the cottage itself and heard the rapping herself. And- so, uh, But at that point they had evacuated from the house. Yes. Because yes. I mean, they, you have a convergence of the public and the convergence yes. of the investigators and everything. <laughs> this is- Oh, oh yeah. I, I could all I could only be very horrified by this because I I tend to be a very private person. I wouldn't want anybody doing this to me. <laughs> Can you imagine people right, going yeah. over, crawling over every part of their of your house? Absolutely and, right. And know? thinking, yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> this has got to be a joke, you know. And they would hear, um, they would send people into the basement 
And then they would ask a question of the spirit and they would listen to see where the knocking noises came from and try to investigate it. Um, you know, so it really, and of course, back then they, you know, Mr. Fox was a devout Methodist. He was sober. Um, he was a very firm family man. And for him, you know, he saw refuge from his church and they were like, we don't want anything to do with you. This, this is horrible. What have you done? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and Mrs. Fox started thinking the same thing, like, oh yeah. my gosh, what did we do? <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. What did we do to deserve this? This is horrible. And she would direct the girls to, you know, if you hear any rapping noises, because not only did they hear them at the Fox cottage, they were hearing them at David's. It followed them wherever they went. And her thoughts were, well, if we ignore it, it'll go away. And it was just the opposite because these spirits were basically 24 seven, we're not going to leave you alone. And, you know, as most mediums know, if you have a message and you don't give it out, you are stuck with it. And you've, you've got to find that that person or that thing or whatever and give that message out there is that um, i will tell you what we've learned so much about mediumship and in, in today's time i don't want people to be so worried about this you can oh, absolutely no, no. have healthy boundaries with spirit so that this never happens to you yes <laughs> absolutely you do not, i do not want people listening to this and thinking mm -mm. oh oh do i have to be worried absolutely nope. not healthy nope. sacred boundaries yes and yes. Beautiful, reverential, reverential, joyful communications to happen with spirit. This is an oddity. Yes. <laughs> this yes. Is an oddity. This was the beginning. This is the beginning of uh, the press getting. But I, before we go forward, because I know there's more we need to cover with this, I want to give people a perspective that spiritualism is actually ancient uh, because people have been talking to spirits and having connections. It's mm -hmm. even uh, in the Bible. Uh, Jesus and other prophets had communications with spirit and that that was a normal natural thing to be expected in those moments of of prayer and contemplation and things that would suddenly appear to them like like Paul yes <laughs> Saul on the road to Damascus speaking Paul after his mm -hmm. vision so there are all these things that happen so I want to make sure that people have that as a background as well. But there's this understanding of during this whole time culturally, there was a revival uh, into understanding more about spiritual matters mm -hmm. and into that space of, of uh, entertainment that some of the Victorians sent this into. Yes. So I think that sets us up nicely to then talk about the aftermath of this big old mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah who knew that you know just by speaking out in the dark at night <laughs> these girls i i don't think they had any idea what was coming for them um but yeah so they they end up um mrs fox feels that by sending kate to rochester that separating the girls is going to make this stop. And so Kate comes home to Rochester with her older sister, Lee, and Maggie stays back with David and Mrs. Fox. Um, but they soon realize that once Kate is in Rochester, it's the rapping noises are now happening in Lee's home as well. And so um, Mrs. Fox decides to reunite the girls, um, safety in numbers, get them back together, and that's when other influential people start getting involved. Um, there were two Quakers, uh, Amy and Isaac Post. Um, they were wonderful people. They had a lot of influence and they kind of took the sisters under their wing and said, you know, hey, we're going to we're going to kind of ease you into this. And, um, you know, this this isn't a bad thing. Um, they introduced them to a lot of people. Uh, Lee became kind of a manager for them and they started giving out their messages. Um, they, they seemed to do very well. Um, it, it was an interesting time for them. Um, you know, this, this was nothing new in other parts of the world. You know, in England, this was a very 
um, very common thing. Um, spiritualism was a, was a religion over there that was well receptive. Um, but over here, you know, it was still a little new and I don't know, we're not really sure about you guys. So we're gonna just investigate this a little bit more. And so uh, there was a panel of uh, gentlemen, um, physicians and uh, free thinkers, um, other different closed mind people as well, who put the girls on display and they actually had them disrobe and then talk to, as they put it, their spirits. And while they did this, uh, rapping noises were everywhere. This was done in Corinthian Hall. And, uh, you know, they were holding on to the girls. Yes, in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And they would hold their joint, you know, their ankles and toes to make sure that they weren't cracking any, any joints. Um, and at the end of the demonstration, these uh, gentlemen did find that there was nothing sinister. They, they couldn't find uh, any claims that the girls were faking this or doing this um, for any other reason that it was just happening. And they, and they put them through, I would consider this is abusive torture, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, you're a teenage girl and yep. this is going on with you and you're probably just in that flow of people demanding, demanding right. this. And, and back then people talking you about it. you the whole time this is right this is, uh, you know people think today's time of social media is difficult i can only imagine in that victorian time mm -hmm. you know you you didn't go around unclothed at all no belly shirts allowed no, <laughs> you know, no ankles showing really so this is a big yeah. deal and so mm -hmm. but as things progress uh they they prove it for some people and some people still don't mm -hmm. believe or however this rolls for them yep. And then, uh, then what happens? So, you know, as they get a little older, they, um, they embark on what I call the world tour. Um, they end up going to a lot of different places. Um, they were received in Ohio, Philadelphia. Um, they were seen in Buffalo, Rochester, Albany. Um, and then New York City kind of became their home base for, for quite a while. Um, all the while, I must say, while they were gone, and it was generally Lee and her daughter, Lizzie, Kate, Maggie, and Mrs. Fox, back in Hydesville, poor Mr. Fox, guess what he's doing? He's working on his house. I feel so bad for the man. He just <laughs> wanted his family home. He wanted his family home. He's, yeah. he's sober. He's he's turned to god yes he's wonderful. done all the right thing and then yeah. what happens <laughs> he's building his yeah he's building his house and he has no women to live there a poor guy you know so yeah but i just like to throw that out there because i i feel bad for him you know, i do a little too bit. Like, i do too um yeah. and you know he he's kind of like that silent partner nobody really not sure what to think about this poor guy, but so anyway, the girls are in New York City. Um, you know, they're they're now a couple years older, and this is the norm for them um, to have long lines of people lining up outside of their hotel suite to come in and talk to them um, and get news from um, you know loved ones that want to communicate. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln was one of the people that sat with the sisters um, because she wanted to communicate with her son. Um, you know, that to me, um, you know, one of the questions was raised that, you know, do you think a lot of people believed them? Um, Mary Todd Lincoln did, because I don't, I don't think the president's wife would have been going to two young girls if, um, you know, she thought this was a hoax. Um, and, and by the time they were in New York City, I think their reputation was pretty much established. Um, and again, just like everything, not everybody is going to believe you, but enough people will that, you know, it gives you credibility. Um, once they're in New York City, that's where Maggie meets her future husband um Elijah Kane and he is the Arctic explorer um, yeah he is, was a, he was really cool explorer guy 
very, very, cool. very, some of his books, his yeah. manuscripts are amazing. And I keep and, thinking, it's how, how on earth did they fall in love? Like that kind of thing. It's like uh, incredible. But then of course he just kept journeying off. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, he, he took off, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to South America. Or, oh, There's the mystery in love. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's, it's kind of funny because he met her during a demonstration um he came to her in with another group and his uh brother came through and his nickname for her was tootie he called her tootie which i think is just adorable <laughs> i don't know why but it's very, yeah I don't but, know a, why but again he she was also 16 and he was like 30. So there was a and he was huge, good looking and he was yeah, really absolutely. well known. I mean, yes, he, he's very well known in his own right. Yep. At the time. Yeah. And he the was first no figure <laughs> he was. Yeah. He was, yeah. you know, kind of that tall, dark and dangerous kind of yeah. guy. He, he's um, the guy in the romance novels. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And he, uh, it was during the seance that he uh, he slipped her a note that said, have you ever been in love? And I think that right there did it. Um, and they from that day on, they just continued writing to each other. Um, he would pay to have private readings from her. Um, you know, I think her mother was a little skeptical at first, um, always with a chaperone. It was never, um, you know, unchaperoned. But unfortunately for Maggie, his family did not approve. No. Oh, they. Whew. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> did not approve. No. She was uneducated. She was poor and she was not Catholic. And that was huge. Um, they did coffin. marry. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. They they did marry. Um, they there is uh, witnesses to the wedding. Uh, and he told Mrs. Fox that when he came back from his three-year exploration, uh, he was going to put an advertisement in the paper and it was going to let everybody know that Maggie was his wife and they had gotten married uh -huh. three, three years. Um, and they were all oh. okay with it. Uh, I'll finally all post it on social media, darling. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Because that your newspaper was how you got your information. And yeah. that was the, that was the Facebook of the time. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, um, for Maggie, he, he died. He contracted malaria while in Havana and, uh, he died before getting back to her. Um, which to me personally, I think that was her, that was her biggest downfall right there. Oh, yeah, Right there. Yep. Losing, um, someone who was so extremely important to her. Um, he, he did, uh, leave her some money. Um, unfortunately the family only gave her a small amount of it, um, not enough to keep her going. Uh, so, you know, she wrote to them and said, Hey, listen, you know, I'm his wife and he left me this money. Um, she wasn't even invited to the funeral. I mean, New York city had a huge parade for him yeah. and she wasn't even invited that, you know, because she, she didn't count. They would do those funeral parade processions thing. yeah processions mm -hmm. for people back then that were famous like this. yes yep absolutely yeah. Yeah. so you know it just it just kind of makes you feel like wow um this poor girl getting her heart ripped out and uh you know she's young, still young she's you know like early 20s um and she's relatively but, good looking Absolutely. I think they were both very you know, good looking girls. I mean, yes. They have that going for them. And mm -hmm. Kate really never seemed to take hold in those ways, though. It no. Didn't work for no. <laughs> no. She was more, um, you know, while Maggie was mooning over this gentleman, um, Kate could have cared less. And I think it was because, you know, she was still so young. She was three years her her uh, junior. And for her, it was all about spirit. And it was all about giving out messages. And that was her passion. Um, but unfortunately, for her, there were two events in her life that changed that. And one of them was the death of her mother. And then three months later, her father died, um, just 
you know, the two people that she depended on the most were gone. Um, and she was kind of left floundering. Um, she basically asked her spirit guides, what do I do? So now what? Um, yeah. And a lot of her friends too, you know, what do I do? Where, what are, what's my purpose? Um, and that's when she went to England. And uh, while she was there, she met so many people um, that were just like her. Um, you know, being a medium was not that big of a deal as it was in, in New York City um, because there were spiritualist churches everywhere. And it was so accepted. Um, and she actually met her husband, who was a spiritualist, um, and they were married in a spiritualist church. Um, you know, he never asked her to to give up her religion or, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you're not educated. Gee, that's too bad. Um, he was, he was very happy with the way she was. And uh, they say that when they were married, that there were soft, quiet rappings heard throughout the church as she walked down the Aww. aisle. Yep. Just as if spirit totally approved. Uh, they had two children. They had two boys. They say that their first son, uh, Ferdinand, they called him Ferdy, um, that he was a prodigy, prodigy, that he was uh, nine months old. He stood up, walked over to a table, picked up a pen, and started writing paragraphs in Latin. He was a very strong medium. Um, so, you know, for Kate, I'm sure that was just, that was wonderful. Um, and unfortunately, just like in life, um, you know, her husband died and Maggie needed her and she came home to the States. Um, you know, it just, it kind of just went downhill from there. Um, when she first came back to New York City, she stayed with her sister, Lee. Um, Lee was the epitome of the boss. Oh, she, she's a boss cow. For sure. Yes. Um, she is not my favorite sister. I yeah. have a, a, a nice respect. I have a very healthy respect for her, but she never had any more children other than her daughter, Lizzie, from her first husband when she was 14. And she had a habit of taking her siblings' children under her wing, paying for their educations. Um, one of her nieces, her name was Lee after her. Um, and she took her in, told everybody it was her daughter. She, you know, tried to do this with Kate, um, you know, and she told Kate, I know what's best for your children and I'm going to raise them. I'm going to school them and educate them. And, and Kate wasn't going to have any part of it. And that's, she called Maggie and said, Hey, I'm moving in with you and we're going to make a go at it. We'll go back to doing our messages and our, ser our services. And, uh, you know, by that time, Maggie was just, uh, Maggie was worn and was like, okay, whatever. Um, yeah, it's very, very sad. And, you know, it is. It, she kind of, there's the degeneration that occurred in her. And I think she stopped turning to the sacred concepts of things and really went into the spiral of, of yeah. deep, dark depression and, and the alcoholism definitely mm -hmm. hit in there unfortunately so yep. I, there's a sad there's sad parts to their stories absolutely sure and i'm sure along the way they did help people yes and along the way there are people who probably thought that they were they were frauds or something like this mm -hmm. there, sure. there's going to be about that uh what most things that go on but around that same time period there were other mediums as you said in england but also in the united states that were evolving and were touring. And some people did it under the uh, idea of being um, magicians or illusionists. Uh, you yeah. had the Davenport brothers that came from Buffalo, New York. You, you had all you know other people like the Eddie brothers of Vermont. You had all these other people that were starting to pop up and things. And if, if people are really interested in the story of the history of spiritualism, I always refer them to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's book. Yeah. It's a nice big, mm -hmm. thick book. Uh, it talks about a lot of the different mediums, including the Fox sisters and really yep. highlights some of the key folks. And I do feel it's, it's a bit of required reading if you are really into spiritualism and want to understand mediumship, because when you see what other people have done, it, it gives you this understanding of inspiration of what you can do too. There's mm -hmm. a lot of physical mediums that are represented in that book. Um, we focus more on what's called mental mediumship in today's times, which would be the giving and receiving of messages without raps and bumps and all those kinds of sorts of things. But 
I think it's important for them to know that. Um, what other books would you say suggest that they can reach out if they want to do more reading about the Fox sisters? I know there's uh, um, Radical Spirits. Yeah, there's and, and you people know, there's... Re refer to that one a lot. Uh, I think I a really interesting I, one because it has women's suffrage connections. Yes. To... Well, you know, and and that's a big thing too because you know in the 1800s um particularly like 1848 and on there was so much going on um you know women were finally getting a voice and you know you had people who were seeking freedom and um especially around here with spiritualism and you know susan b anthony and frederick Douglass and all of this stuff was going on um i really like as far as the Fox sisters are concerned, um, I always like to start with primary documents because those are, you know, to me, that is the most accurate. You're gonna get as close to the truth as you possibly can by reading someone's diary. It's basically it. Um, you know, a lot of people have their opinions and different things that they like to read and that's fine. Um, because I think you need to see the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, it, it can't all be good. It's life. They were human. Um, so, you know, anything really, um, I do like, um, Miriam Buckner Pond wrote, um, time is unkind, the story of the unfortunate Fox family. Um, that is from her point of view because she married into the family. She married one of David's, um, I believe it was his, either his grandson or his nephew. Um, so she has a lot of insight there as well. Um, it, it, there's just, there's a lot of books out there. A lot of books. Um, it's, it's been a just... popular topic for spiritualists and, and also other people that are interested in spirit communication with some of the, the idea of the, the spook and boo attached. You mm -hmm. know, the Fox sisters, I, I completely admit it's more along the stories line of a spook and boo. <laughs> That's what I call it. Mm -hmm. And you yep. definitely have that. But I think the, the big takeaway for people is that this uh, galvanized a lot of people who, who maybe hadn't wanted to give credence or didn't know how to give credence or hadn't had that in their consciousness before that they could talk to people in spirit mm -hmm. and that there was a, definitely a shift in uh, how women were portrayed I, as a medium you could get up and speak at an event you could do a lecture you could give messages it was a, a really important uh, time in the women's rights movement for that to happen and so this is all going on around this fox sisters time it's really beautiful. right yeah you've done such a great job of explaining <laughs> the history tracy you, i i hope you guys really super appreciate the fact that tracy has <laughs> basically blood sweat and tears put into all of this yeah <laughs> some days i think that yeah i mean i i've even gone so far i have the fox family tree um that's that was one of my things that i had been working on every summer i try to pick something that um you know maybe somebody doesn't know or um you know one one year it was oh well we're gonna go to david fox's house and we're gonna explore um one time i don't know like i i just i have I don't know. I, there's just this love. I sometimes I feel like maybe Kate Fox sits down on my lap and I just walk into her. She walks into me. I don't know. She's my absolute favorite. And um, I just I feel like I know these guys like I know them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's crazy. I can't explain. I it. can I can see you know them. I mean that you feel such kinship with them, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so special that you've taken uh, this on as a, a big life project for yourself, a, a love and obsession. <laughs> I'll, it I, is I, an I guess I can use obsession, right? Mm -hmm. Oh <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you you could just feel that the great love of the details and the exploration of mapping that all out and understanding on a, almost a deep vibrational level. So you've really brought that to our show today. I appreciate that Thank very, you. very much. Um, is this, this is probably a good time to tell them that um, March 31st coming up, you guys, 
if you want to celebrate with Tracy and other people who are who are going to be putting on some beautiful things on Facebook, uh, what's the Facebook page they can check you out? I will link it to this video, but what's the Facebook page you, you'd like to send them to for that? Um, we do have a page for um, for the Fox Sisters. It is Fox Sisters of Hydesville um, on Facebook. We also have, an, we have, there's a group for the Fox Sisters. Um, any of the Lilydale sites you can go to as well. Um, they should link you right to the Fox Sisters um, or find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm on there all the time. Tracy's um, open and, and, and I know that they, they, they've been taking donations for a number of years in order to help you know maintain that Highsville Memorial Park area, the schoolhouse being very important. Uh, in that project. And I'll put the link for the donations if anybody's wanting to donate to history, the maintaining of history, and, you know, all the things that that Tracy uh, really sees and feels and understands about the Fox sisters, and other people from around the world that love the story. You know, it's important that that, that live on, if only to have people understand a, a bit of what sensationalism can do. Right. <laughs> sensationalism yeah. can do um, and the effects of this and especially spirit communication um, in Victorian times amazing yeah amazing. I know. any last thoughts before we close for today our show you've covered so much I yeah well and yeah. you know and there there's so much more I yeah. mean you know when you <laughs> when you think about you know after the Fox sisters were gone and, you know, they found, they finally found the bones of the peddler in the original foundation, which is what our enclosure on the property protects uh, the original foundation from 1815. And, uh, you know, they moved the house to Lilydale. Um, that was in 1925. Um, and then there was a fire or 1916, excuse me. Um, one of the things that we will be revealing um which i really haven't there's only one other person that really knows about this um, so you, you'll you'll be number two willa and your um your listeners um so uh, uh last year when covid hit um right before our big celebration for um 2020 we i had someone who actually lived down the road from me um she was the great niece of our neighbor and she called me and she said hey you know he had passed away we were going through some of his stuff his wife and her mother you know blah 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 blah. they had lived there forever so she said we found something um we don't know what to do with it we don't really want it but we think it belongs to you and i said okay so they met me at the fox property they insisted on coming down there they handed me a board from the original house, which is absolutely amazing. And the story is that this uh, gentleman, our neighbor, his mother-in-law and her sister, when they were young girls, went to the property in 1916 when they were taking the house apart to move to Lilydale and they stole this board. <laughs> In they the took the neighbors are thieves <laughs> <laughs> they took yeah they took this board and they brought it back and they wrote on a piece of paper from the original cottage in Hydesville and they wrote the date and they wrapped it up and they put it in their dresser drawer and that's where it sat and so they gave this to me and I was just like Oh, 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 I think I might have the only um, original piece of the Fox Cottage that is left. Wow. So, which is pretty impressive. This and is big uh, news. it's huge wow. news. It's huge. So, um, I also have a trunk lid, and uh, that belonged to David Fox. It was found in the attic of his home. Um, I don't know what the lid is from other than it's an old trunk and it dates back to the 1800s so we have that and i also have the skeleton key to the front door 
you've got yeah. you've got the front door and and you know i will i just have to mention because i think it's so thrilling that you found it it's almost like being an archaeologist right absolutely you, you are an archaeologist of spiritualism <laughs> So now you are you going to have to test the board? <laughs> oh boy, you know I'm dating of the board. <laughs> I licked it to make sure it wasn't bone. <laughs> it must be a dried up piece of something. I mean, it must be like it, just, it has a most petrified feel to it, maybe. Or um, it been it's wrapped it's and just a nicely? piece of it. They really did a nice job. I don't think they ever took it out. I think they were so scared they were going to get in trouble <laughs> that they probably forgot about it. Um, but it, it's, it's like a very, mummy all wrapped up like in a sarcophagus yeah, drawer. <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly so what it was. <laughs> yep. That's exactly what it was like. So cool. it, it's really cool. And it's just a piece, you know, it's just like a piece of slab board, um, which our area here on Sand Hill Road was known as Slab City because they used to make the slab board. So it's just, there's just so much history. And then so it makes much you wonder history. if anybody said, hey, wait, we're missing this board when they finally right? get really down. Like, wouldn't it be cool if somebody could say, and there was a missing board? Oh my gosh, that would be so incredible. So like, because I they know. did. I, put I'm it... just thinking, how else can we verify and right. get more to it? But right. That's yeah. So cool. Yeah, because they had to put it back together. They did. They had to. Yeah, they restored it. And here in the Lake Yell, there is the, the Fox Cottage Park yep. that is not far from the Healing Temple. If anyone yep. ever you know, is visiting the Lake Yell, it's not far. It's on that same street on uh, East and I will say at the Lily Dale Museum, they do have a, a little, um, would that be called a diorama? They have a little diorama of the Fox mm -hmm. Cottage and Peddler's Trunk. Yeah. And they have those things in there. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the museum's open, non-COVID times, that's something that you should put on your list. If this is something that you're, that's of interest to you, you know, you can still go look in the Lily mm -hmm. Museum at those items, but yep. really cool. I'm sure, you know, it's possible you'll find other things as well. Never you know. never know. You never know never who stole know. from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we even have a, we have a, a headstone from David's daughter that has never been outside in the elements. She died in 1848. And her headstone, once the enclosure went back up over the original foundation, this headstone appeared at the back door and it's it's like brand new somebody took it um because mr drummond was the original caretaker he built the replica house on top of the original foundation so he had all this crazy stuff crazy and stuff. yeah and so now we have david fox's daughter's headstone yeah. we don't know where she is but yeah. Right, right. Well, who yeah. knows what will land on your doorstep next? Dun, dun, dun. Can't imagine. I it's know. Put the ell ellipsis of the dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Very <laughs> to be continued. Well, on I that note, it. I will say thank you so much for being on the show today, Tracy. It's been wonderful for you to share about the Fox Sisters. I think it really gave people, you know, that interior view into their life and what mm -hmm. led up to it and then the aftermath of, uh, of all that sensationalized news and, and investigation that came from their lives. And, you know, we are standing to some extent on their shoulders and on the shoulders of many other mediums that have gone before us and, and spiritualists that have gone before us that really understand that transcending all of this is to give you an understanding of your own soul, that you are a soul and as such, you have unlimited potential for love and peace and joy and that you do not truly die, so-called death, uh, just as uh, as Jesus tried to explain to people, uh, you know, you, you don't really die. It's a really important message that's a central part of spiritualism. Absolutely. Uh, so beautiful. Well, tune in next week on Wednesdays with Willa at 10 a.m. on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. Thanks everyone for being here. Bye-bye.